Good afternoon. My name is Gus Noble and greetings from uh, snowy Chicago. Today the, the world celebrates Robert Burns 264th birthday. In just a few moments I'll be joined by Scottish poet Michael Peterson and over the next hour Michael and I will look at Robert Burns, his life and legacy, his, his words and wit, his views and values, his politics, peculiarity and his poetry. And beyond Robert Burns, we'll also discuss Scotland, Scottish identity, poetry, music, friendship and oysters. But I want to start by thanking you for joining the Chicago Scots, Illinois' first and oldest not-for-profit. I particularly want to thank uh, those of you who believe in the Chicago Scots principal charity, Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, a care home where an impeccable record of safety in the COVID-19 pandemic has been made possible by the incredible people who live and work in this unique community, and particularly their commitment to our core values, home, family and love. I offer special appreciation for our friends and partners, the National Trust for Scotland USA, the American Scottish Foundation and the Scottish Government USA. Now, now a word on how today's discussion will work. My conversation with Michael will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for some questions. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A interface at any point during the discussion. We'll see your questions and I'll be happy to ask them on your behalf. I'm delighted that joining me today to celebrate Robert Burns' birthday is one of Scot Scotland's brightest literary talents, poet Michael Peterson. Michael won the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship, the John Mather Trust's Rising Star of Literature Award, and was named on Canongate's Future 40, a list of people who will impact the literary scene over the next four decades. Michael has written several books, including one called Boyfriends, about which we'll talk a bit later on today. And no less a talent than Irvin Welsh said this, Michael's poems get under my skin. As well as defining and codifying my own experiences, they also challenge them. And I always feel more upbeat and hopeful after having read them. You really can't ask much more from a poet. And if you like poetry that's cool, smart, hilarious, and quirky, and can just suddenly rip your heart out, then Michael Peterson is your man. Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Gus. It's nice to see you. I'm beaming in from the West End of Glasgow. Well, welcome to a snowy Chicago, a snowbound Chicago. Let, let's begin by uh, talking about Burns. You've called Robert Pern, Burns poetry's gateway drug. Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, well, growing up in Scotland, uh, a very small country that's super proud of its literature, of its writers, of its artists. We very much feel we punch above our weight when it comes to writers and particularly when it comes to poets. So if you go to school, if you're educated in Scotland in any way, you can't get away from Burns. It's going to be part of the curriculum. You're probably going to be made to try and recite Burns poetry in front of the girls and guys you fancy from as young as like eight, ten years old. So you might as well embrace Burns. It's going to be this pivotal part of your edification. So you have to find Burns on your own terms. And there's so many ways into Burns, into poetry. Um, but I think particularly from a masculine perspective, um, whether it could be mockable, tauntable, to say that you were into poetry from a young age, Burns was the exception to that because he was the working class poet the socialist poet. He did body readings of poetry in the pubs and inns of Scotland. And he was celebrated um, by the working classes, much like football stars, soccer stars are celebrated today. He had ego. He had a reputation as 
an entertainer, as having a sharp tongue, a bit of a filthy tongue at times, as being a bit of a fornicator. So there was this whole bravado around Burns, which allowed people to enjoy, recite, embrace poetry, almost with the caveat or the protection of saying, oh, but it's Burns. He's one of the guys. He's one of the lads. He's this sort of vervacious ladies man. Of course, we like Burns poetry. All that other stuff, I'm not so sure. And of course, it was the socialist poetry that pulled them in a lot of the time. A man's a man for all of that. The poet of brotherly love, um, the poet of kicking, kicking back against the establishment. That's what pulled them in. But in fact, very quickly, they found themselves reading love poetry. Uh, love is like a red, red rose or any of these things. And they were engrossed in tender poetry, tender love ballads really quickly and could find themselves reciting them, sometimes to people they were trying to swoo or wound. Um, and the whole notion in contemporary Scotland today of celebrating Burns is having a bit of a party around them. It's not a reading in a library at 10 in the morning um, with a, a hush silence around it. Uh, Burns nights are raucous events. They're full of whiskey and dancing and Kayleys and people might get a bit of a snog at them. They might turn into like sexy, exciting affairs. They might change your life. Who knows who, who you might hook up with that evening. Um, and a Burns night became a bit of a hoo-ha, a bit of a hubbub. So it was okay to go to poetry readings for the first time when you were young because it was a Burns night because Robert Burns has endorsed it and that meant there was some sort of like uh, bravado or excitement to it which wasn't supposed to happen within the realms of poetry. But then people enjoying Burns nights would find themselves a bit impatient for wait to January to come round again when the world celebrates Burns or Hogmanay when they're singing Old Lang Syne, which has been, you know, translated into over a hundred different languages for a New Year song now. Um, so they would find themselves looking to the other Scottish poets. Who could sustain us? Um, what other poetry parties were out there at this point in time? And then all of a sudden it became cool to go to a poetry event if it was a bit like a Burns night. Um, and all of these young guys who I guess were keeping their emotions in cages at times um, were now embracing them. So Burns became the emotional passport to these guys own emotionality and some people would be triggered or catalyzed into writing poetry for the first times because of Burns. Um, and yeah, Burns being so celebrated and fixed to his birthday meant there was 11 other months of the calendar year where people who've decided that he switched something on inside of them had a hunger for mm -hmm. other forms of poetry. Um, and that's where contemporary literature has, has thrived. The universality of Burns, um, his popularity, his prominence, his ability to come back year by year in Scotland and the world's interest not, of, not to have dwindled has made Scotland and hundreds of poets and the word of Burns been a bit of a torchlight for contemporary poetry ever since Burns left us. Thanks, Mike. It's, uh, I mean, if you think about the the enduring resonance of Robert Burns, it's it's incredible, and Burns encourages us to see ourselves as others see us. But if we we kind of flip the script and begin to look at Burns himself, there's kind of a lot of elephants in the room there. Uh, we shouldn't yeah. be afraid to talk about those, should we? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's the argument of can we view Burns under a contemporary lens? Um, and I think we can view him under a contemporary lens. I think we can think about how his poems would have resonated today. Um, I think we can consider if we would write poetry of that style, of that um, that that sort of wildness at times. Um, but I think uh, to pass judgment on it is a different course altogether. Burns was a, was human. He was fractured. He was a man of multitudes. Um, he was the people's poet at the, the same time as taking huge commissions off the establishment. Um, he wrote The Slave's Lament, um, this beautiful piece of humanitarian poetry, yet very nearly went to Jamaica to take a job 
within the within the slate trade and in the accounts and the production department essentially was where he would have went but he would have been facilitating that industry and that causes a lot of problems in the way that people view burns some people would like to uh, forget burns uh, ever ever nearly engaged in that but of course there's been reimaginings there's been jamaican scottish poets writing poetry um as if Burns had learnt some of the Jamaican language uh, from that perspective to try and evaluate it. I agree with Jackie Kay on that matter. I think Burns would have went to Jamaica um, and very quickly turned back. Um, a lot of his friends or people he knew worked within this industry. It wasn't a shocking or a surprising thing, unfortunately, at that point in time. There was a lot of money being made in Scotland out through the slave industry, through those exportations. And Burns, I guess, thought he could have brought a more uh, responsible aspect to some of those positions. But I feel like, or I certainly hope, um, through the engine of the Burns poems that I've learned to love, that he would have saw the vulgarity of that industry and very would have very quickly would have turned back, would have um, decided he'd made the wrong decision, learned from it, came back to Scotland and became part of the cause to end slavery from that perspective. But thankfully, um, and luckily for Scotland and for Burns, we were spared that conclusion because in order to raise the money to pay for his ticket to get over to Jamaica, he published his first proper volume of poems and um, poems chiefly in a Scottish dialect. And the popularity of those and the reception of those and the income that those built, built, um, brought to him um, justified him dedicating himself more full-heartedly to poetry and to staying in Scotland where it seems like his words were resonating to a scale that even he didn't understand at that point in time. So it's such a beautiful escape from could, uh, deeper considerations of if Burns had ever worked within that the, the slaving industry to know that it's his poems that pulled him out of there. It's incredible to think about the dichotomy to, between his words and potential deeds, and and what what words could be more powerful than a man's a man for all that. And if if you and our our friends at the National Trust for Scotland USA are okay, we'd like to show a short film of you reading Michael from uh, the the uh, Burns Cottage in Ayrshire, a man's a man for all that. Jack, uh, can I leave it to you to press play and and roll it? A man's a man for all of that. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head in all of that? The coward slave, we pass him by. We dare be poor for all of that. For all of that, in all of that, our toils obscure in all of that. The rank is but the guinea's stamp. The man's the goud for all of that. What thou? On hamely fair we dine, where hood and grey and all of that, gee fools their silk and knaves their wine. A man's a man for all of that, for all of that and all of that, their tinsel show and all of that. The honest man, though e'er say poor, is king of men for all of that. You see, yon Berkey called a lord who struts and stares and all of that. Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a coof for all of that, for all of that, and all of that, his ribbon star, and all of that. The man, O oh, independent mind, he looks and laughs at all of that. A prince can mark a belted knight, a marquis, duke, and all of that. But an honest man's a boon his might, good faith, a money for that. For all of that, and all of that, their dignities, and all of that, the pith of sense and pride of worth are higher rank than all of that. Then let us pray that come at me as come at will for all of that, that sense and worth o'er the earth shall bear the gree and all of that. For all of that, and all of that, it's coming yet. For all of that, that man to man, 
the world o'er shall brothers be for all of that. What a brilliant poem, brilliant poem. Michael, yeah. let's talk about Michael Peterson for a second. How did Michael the lawyer become Michael the poet? Yeah, well, I guess um, full-time poetry uh, is is a tough career to float from a from an early age, from your teenage years, to say you're going to unravel into being a full-time writer without the life experience nor the skill set to be able to do that from a certain perspective. So when I was faced with ticking the box for university, um, I had a sort of poetry mentor at the time. Um, that sounds a bit more officiated than it is. It was actually a pal's uncle that I would go around to and read poetry at and um, uh, ruminate over like where life was going to head after high school. And I chatted to him and he said, look, I don't think you should study literature. I don't think you should study it as an academic discipline. I feel like you should do an essay based subject that poetry is feeding you in that way that your sort of voracious appetite for writing has been triggered um, by how you're currently experiencing poetry in a much more visceral form that if you take it into the classroom, it might go all wrong for you. It might frustrate you. And being a young guy that grown up on Ted Hughes's poetry at that point in time, I was romanticized by the fact that Ted Hughes had went to Cambridge to study English literature and then had this terrible dream uh, of the fox coming to him in the night time. And the fox just said to him, this sort of demon fox character, you're ruining this for us. And it was all about how the academic discipline of literature for him, particular to him, was ruining his love and his verb for poetry. And then he changed to anthropology, I think. Um, and that poem became The Thought Fox, one of Ted Hughes's most famous poems. So the fact that I could have some sort of semblance of narrative or conversational personal take on that incident with Hughes made me um, jump for joy a little bit. But then I had the conundrum, the quandary of deciding what to study. But when I'm really wanting to study literature and creative writing, but feeling that maybe that would come later. Um, so a long night of thinking down, I guess, to a click of the fingers, I decided that law was the most pedantic interpretation of the English language outside of literature and linguistics that I was going to come across. Whole cases swayed right or left based on the interpretation of these small parcels of dictions and people's lives and livelihoods depended on it. Um, the titles of case names were like the titles of books and the case synopsises were like the story synopsises, the, the full case manuscripts and the precedent of them like the the full manuscript of, of novels. So I still took this literary perspective or this literary sort of formula and applied it to legal studies. Um, and of course, after I finished university, I acquired a bit of debt, sort of working class background, went off to a nice posh collegiate, collegiate university in England, um, took out the student loans and the student overdrafts. And then I got offered the opportunity um, to get a scholarship to do the postgraduate course and to do the two year qualification to become a solicitor. Uh, it would have been too difficult a conversation to have with my dad at that point in time to say I was going to flee it for the more financially lucrative career of poetry. <laughs> um, so I did that next stage. Uh, I fulfilled all the obligations of the traineeship and I fully qualified as a solicitor down in Lo uh, London. And then with the majority of my student debts paid off and a solid vocation behind me, I abdicated for Cambodia and spent a year out there trying to develop um, a body of work, a body of poems that I could come back to Scotland with and try and uh, try and make my way. And by the time I came back, I had a, a small book, a chat book published, which had been awarded for a few prizes and had someone interested in the, the first full length collection. Um, and went straight into starting a live literature night and organisation quite quickly through a few fortuitous meetings. And that took 
the edge off the conversation with my dad that I might not be coming back to the law. And of course, it massively resonated with me, something we'll come back to later, I think, because reading that Robert Louis Stevenson had that same struggle. His dad had pushed him into doing engineering at university. He only wanted to do literature. They came to the amicable negotiation that law was somewhere in the middle of it because of the advocacy, because of the oratorial nature of it, um, the heavy linguistic emphasis of it, that they would settle for law as a middle ground. And of course, for him, like me, it was a short term career. You know, we're going to uh, talk about Robert Louis Stevenson and your, your current work in just a minute. Um, but when you returned to Scotland, you started this group um, in, in Edinburgh, Noi Riki. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a wee bit about that? And if I might, I, I'll uh, see if I can persuade you to read one of the poems that perhaps uh, appeared during one of the Noi Riki evenings. Yeah, so Noi Riki um, was the literary night that I started when I when I got back from Cambodia, when I was thrusting myself upon the literary sector. Um, and I met another writer called Kevin Williamson. He was a couple of few decades older than me, so he'd published some books. He'd run a small publishing house called Rebel Inc., which started off as a, a sort of punk literary style fanzine. Um, and very quickly they were publishing people like Irvin Welsh before Train Spotting came out. They got some early segments of that, one of the first places Irvin got published. Um, they published Alan Warner uh, before Marvin Caller became out, Laura Hurd, a lot of these Scottish writers that became major working class voices. Um, Rebel Inc. found their way um, into them. They got uh, engulfed by a bigger publishing house called Canongate ended up making incredible books as objects and had five or six years, maybe a bit longer, as one of the world's foremost punk publishers. They went over to City Lights in San Francisco, did a collaboration with them, published a lot of um, contemporary classics of American literature, republishing it in Scotland and the UK for the first time. And I'd missed all that. His company had ended in a big courtroom dispute, uh, as rightly it should by that point in time. And I was a bit sort of crestfallen that I'd missed that. And we got billed to read together. And Kevin turned up actually wearing a luminous orange tra kappa tracksuit and a pair of Oakley sunglasses and did Burns cover poems and said, no, I mean, this is what Burns would wear if he was about today. Um, and I liked his vibe. And I'd set up this show, a sort of um, illicit show during the Edinburgh Festival uh, with bands involving like uh, rock bands and hip hop bands and short filmmakers and poetry. Kevin was one of the writers I booked to do that. Uh, and after it, he said, let's not wait till the festival comes back this time next year. Let's do this more regularly. Let's start a salon. And Noiriki started as a poetry and an avant-garde animation club. We would show poetry juxtaposed or punctuated by avant-garde animation. Um, and all of a sudden, some people from big bands started coming along to the nights. Uh, and after three or four events, we ended up having... Uh, a couple of the guys from Bell and Sebastian turn up and do Elvis Presley covers. A couple of the guys from um, Teenage Fan Club turned up and started doing Velvet Underground covers. So Noiriki came a uh, mixing pot of ideas with poetry at the forefront of it that you didn't have to do what was expected of you. It was experimental. It was risky at times. It was very much a review show. You could present half forms things. It didn't have to be... Uh, find its way or be labelled by a genre or a category, it could still be working itself out. Um, and the nights got bigger and bigger. We very quickly had Liz Lockhead reading for us and Jackie Kay and Irvin Welsh and a lot of the major Scottish literary figures. Um, fast forward to 10 years later, and Noiriki's become a small publishing house, a small record label, we were getting major commissions to do shows for national galleries, national museums, uh, some of the biggest art festivals in the world. We'd taken uh, Noriki to New York, to New Zealand, to Tokyo, to Malawi and the Southern African states, uh, all over the world, doing our unique brand of Scottish poetic infused arts extravaganzas. 
Um, and for the first time, I've just put Noriki along with the other team members into hibernation for a few years um, as I work on my own writing projects, which I guess were demanding more and more of my time and more and more servicing. Um, that I almost felt neglectful to be doing as many of the Noriki shows alongside them. And having celebrated a big 10 year anniversary, sort of 12 years, given the two lost COVID years, it felt like a good time to put it to bed. So, of course, we ended Noiriki with a show in one of Edinburgh's biggest breweries where they made a special Noiriki beer they'd been working on for a while and had a real roll call of some of our favourite performers over the last 10 years. Uh, gave it a, a huge send off right in the middle of the festival after like previous previous few runs of big Edinburgh International Festival shows and Edinburgh Book Festival shows. We pulled it away from all that and did it on our own terms in our own place. So it felt like the send off for now, it deserved. And of course, one of the great things about curating literary nights is you create, you create and design the night that you would like to see. So I, I was putting on some of my favourite bands alongside some of my favourite poets, alongside some of my favourite filmmakers. Um, and of course, them being people of such uh, artistic panache were many people's favourite poets and bands and filmmakers. But you essentially get the privilege of designing the exact show that you would like to see um, and hoping everyone else will come along in the process. And, and thankfully, they did for, for, for over a decade. Well, when, when you decide to press unhibernate, uh, bring it to Chicago. We'd love to, we'd love to welcome you to Chicago. Um, and, and would you be willing to... Give us one of your poems. Yeah. So I'm going to do a poem called Lines on the Melodies of Men. I figured it will seep to into some of the crevices of everything that we were talking about today. It was uh, initially an Edinburgh Book Festival for a commission for their uh, international literature festival broadcast, where there was 24 hours of poetry broadcast um, over 24 different book festivals across the world. We followed the, um, the different timelines or, or, or time zones around the globe and I was reading as part of Edinburgh's which is still technically the biggest book festival in the world um, but Burns himself is you know the ultimate macho man but then the ultimate soft sappy romantic at the same time he's such a duplicitous being and I think if we dig a little deeper inside of ourselves we find all of those elements of bravado and vulnerability so easily just floating away below the border of it all. Lines on the melodies in men. It is funny, I say to Kay, who's wading shirtless in the burn, the things we remember about growing. As a boy, I played a game with my uncle where I blew into his boxer's thumb as he bloomed his muckle bicep, the sugarly inkwork of his tattoos smearing to a blur, arms bulging bigger with each puff I stuck him with, stuff solid as a cloud before emptying its storm. I blast another lungful down the thumb's portal, slurp up the tobacco scum, lick my lips like licorice. If they don't give it you, my uncle gruffs, showboating his trophy muscles, take it with ease. A forced ending, a cloven hoofed ars poetica of Danish Harry, das toughest brother. Pop eye arms, I faked coveting them, knowing fine well not even with a marching band would I let that music in. It was the physical play I loved, the luminous swell, like a kissing ritual without the kiss. The melodies in men are sometimes my arch nemesis, a neighbour's tusk, the wicked nimbus gunning for a better version for my soft and silly, though mostly their hot courage, brave bones stookied in mucky fun, the buttress of friends hatching body super stanzas together.
we might lay to rest our unclings bedraggled sermons. They're just a generational thing, a not in our blood thing, a I do love you, you know that, but for fuck's sake I shouldn't have to broadcast it thing. Just oh, all the possibilities of a river. In the future, I tell Kay, we will hear each other better. A friend will clasp my hand and beg me be in touch more often, to touch more often. He'll say he's been thinking of me, that he knows it's going to hurt hellfire, all the while holding firm as moon grips. Promise, cast not as we splinter into the next stage, but heart beat wet in the here now. Words as close to their import as a sparked match. Wow, thank you very much. What a poem. You uh, tell us about your current work uh, that you're doing about Robert Louis Stevenson. I was fascinated when we, we spoke about it for, for lots of reasons. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's time in Chicago, brief time in Chicago was one of them, but your process, how you're going about it, and the things you've learned, the, the lost letters that uh, were recently discovered highlighting the friendship between J.M. Barry and Stevenson. Yeah, so I guess I've been going through a real carousel of genres at the moment. Uh, poetry's all, always been the main one for me, you know, po po writing poetry will will always be my touchstone, my keystone. Uh, my first book of collection of poetry was published in 2013 and then I had Oyster in 2017 and I've got the Cat Prince in July this year. Um, but I've been a little traitor to the cause of recent and uh, I published a non-fiction book last year which comes out again, it came out in the UK and America, Boyfriends, that I know we're going to touch on. But this last 25 days, so this first 25 days of this year, uh, I cancelled all gigs, all workshops, all social arrangements, and I've just been in this sort of cave of a writing den trying to write my first ever fiction novel. Um, and it's set on a remote Scottish island called Muckleflugger, where there's a lighthouse, and one of the key protagonists is Robert Louis Stevenson, or rather the ghost of Robert Louis Stevenson, who appears as a sort of life coach and a confidant um, for one of the other main characters who's in a bit of trouble and is definitely in need of some nourishment, support and advice. Uh, because uh, I've written so much about friendship, particularly male friendship, um, that, and I've been such a fan of Stevenson, that to have discovered this book last year, um, which contains all of Robert Louis Stevenson's letters. So the author of, you know, Kidnapped, Treasure Island, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, to a dear friend of his, J.M. Barry, who was most notably known for writing Peter Pan. So you've got these great two Scottish writers who had this really romantic friendship by letters for years, decades of their life, but in fact never met. And all of these letters are littered and plagued with this sort of anticipation of the meeting. Um, and it almost feels like a consummation of love. And friendships are full of love and are romantic and do create all of the chemical excitements that uh, a more physical love creates alongside it. Um, but in fact, I was one of many who was hoodwinked or beguiled by a story that J.M. Barry wrote after Stevenson died um, that has the meeting in Edinburgh and they get drunk together around a few taverns. They go and play like chapdoor run where you knock on someone's door and then disappear and they come out all flustered about what's going on and just get up to all sort of like uh, mischief, like the mavericks that they are at that point in time. And I thought, oh, well, at least they had that one night out together, that one time where they, where they did meet each other. Stevenson obviously moves to America and then eventually settles in Samoa. And this is in, you know, the 1890s, 1880s. So it's a, it's, it's a lot trickier to get to Samoa than it is, uh, than it is today from Scotland. Um, so that wasn't in fact real. It was entirely apocryphal and it was a heavy hearted J.M. Barry trying to right the wrong that he didn't do in life. And that was creating, that, that was failing to visit and to meet his dear friend, Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, and I was just so ensorcelled and enthralled by that story that I thought, 
these characters are becoming more than their books. They're becoming the the evidence, the blueprint of the friendship behind them, and and that was becoming a major influence. And I just had to had to do something with it, um, and 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 hopefully have done. You've written incredibly powerfully about friendship, and we'll we'll get onto that in just a moment. But well, let's stay on Robert Louis Stevenson for for just a, a short while longer. You were a Robert Louis Stevenson fellow, and I'd be really interested to hear what that experience was like. But you've also said something that I think perhaps uh, might be part of that experience, or certainly the experience gave you the perspective, and I quote, that Scotland is great at looking after writers. Uh, um, what, what, what do you mean by that? And tell us about your experience. So that's a very personal statement, but then it has wider implications. Uh, the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship has run in Scotland since the 90s. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson was one of these great Scots that left Scotland a lot. He travelled the world. He was, a, he was a big traveller. He lived in California for a while. He stopped by Chicago, which I wasn't aware of. He settled in Samoa. Um, a lot of that was to do with the fact that he was of quite a sickly disposition he, and was he seeking hotter climates that he felt would be um, gentler with his uh, physical well-being. Um, but also he loved to travel. You know, I mean, you see this in Treasure Island and, oh, and in a lot of his work, somebody gets on a boat and goes somewhere. There is that sort of first to discover the world, to experience new things. Um, and one of the most inspirational places Robert Louise Stevenson went was a place called Grez, grez sur um, which is south west of Paris, about an hour southwest of Paris near the Fontainebleau Forest. Um, really beautiful place that watercolorists from all across the world went to paint this particular bridge, this particular landscape there. Um, very ancient, a lot of the royals used to holiday there. Um, it, but at that point in time, it was sort of taken over by an artist colony, wealthy artist colony, but painters, composers, writers, they were all there. You know, they'd got sick and tired of the pretenses of Paris and they'd moved to the, moved to the sticks so they could afford themselves the glamour of Paris while feeling like they were a part of um, timeless nature. And Robert Louis Stevenson went there. Not only did he pen some of his... Um, the, the naissance of some of his great works, but he also met the love of his life, Fanny Osborne, his wife to be. Uh, she was an American who'd moved to Paris with her kid to uh, paint, uh, was fleeing or fleeing a sort of philandering husband at that point in time. So was separated, but very much still married. And Robert Louis Stevenson and her met there. So as part of this prize, you get to go to Grace, you get some cash so that you can buy your way out of rent or financial obligations for a month. You get to live in this Hotel Chevignon, this sort of semi-chateau for a month and swan about being a fancy as hell writer like Stevenson was at that point in time. And not only is there all that literary history of the area, but there's the whole... Uh, the love, the sexiness of the fact that you know that this is where he met Fanny Osborne as well. So it's an inspiring place for several different reasons. And I guess that's what I mean by Scotland looks after its writers, that the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship is one of the is, is one of quite a few different funded, paid for, uh, laurelled, prize worthy residencies that Scotland gives to writers at key parts of their career. And then that could be like an early career writer, or it could be a mid-career writer, or even a big hitter of a writer who's not published something in a few years and has maybe fallen into a slump. Scotland realizes that literature and books in particular is one of its greatest resources and it and it does foment that. It looks out, uh, looks out for writers. Edinburgh got crowned the world's first ever UNESCO city of literature. Um, Edinburgh has the Walter Scott Monument on its high street, which up until not long ago was the biggest monument built for any writer in the world. It's certainly the most phallic looking of them. <laughs> um, Edinburgh's central stain train station, Waverley, is named after Walter Scott's Waverley books. Um, there's so much literary history in the streets. There's a huge statue of Robert Burns. There's Robert Ferguson on the high street. Um, 
a lot of celebration has been the past few years and focusing on Muriel Spark as well, who wrote Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, um, our contemporary writers from Irvin Welsh's Train Spotting Phenomenon to J.K. Rowland's Harry Potter Phenomenon, um, pulse so big the world over. Uh, and Scotland's pretty good at valuing that. We have an incredible poetry, Scottish poetry library, um, one of the only a few in the world dedicated solely to poetry, right in the centre of the city, or just off the busiest street, the high street in it, um, which is free and open access to it all and puts on great events. So if you're interested in literature and if you seem to have a bit of a um, propensity for it, um, then there's opportunities to be had here. Um, and I think that's a great thing for a nation to be that proud of its art. I mean, there's very few countries in the world that celebrate a poet to the degree that we celebrate Burns. Yeah, that's true. Po poetry is such an important part of um, Scotland's identity and, and how we, we can experience Scotland. But one of the most important voices uh, in a contemporary sense is the Macker, the, the Poet Laureate of Scotland. And on this day last year, we, we were um, delighted to host uh, Kathleen Jamie and and before her we presented our inaugural Mackers model of the uh, Mackers medal of the Chicago Scots to Jackie Kay uh, but you sit on a, a board to select Scotland's Macker uh, can you tell us about your role and the importance of the Macker? So I did last time yeah for Kathleen's appointment there was 10 people appointed from it's all public and um, from across literary arts uh, somebody from the Poetry Library, someone from the government, from Creative Scotland, people that organise big poetry festivals in Scotland, curate events, run publishing houses. Um, and we all got together and I guess the raison d'etre of that is to make a recommendation to the First Minister who to appoint. Um, but for the first time this year, the First Minister, after seeing the shortlist, passed it back to the board to make the appointment. So for the first time this group, the selection of literary bodies and literary enthusiasts and practitioners within the field appointed our national poet, our maker, that being the old Scots for essentially maker, maker of words. Um, and we did something interesting with it this year, which hadn't been done before, and that was to reduce the term from five years to three years. Right. Um, now the UK Poet Laureate very not long ago was a position for life and that has been reduced to 10 years, but that's still a decade. That's still 10 years of obligation of a poet's life. Um, that's still 10 years of somebody being appointed who's right for the time, but might not be right for the time at the other end of that. Um, a lot can happen as a decade, as we've seen in the last 10 years and, and most likely every 10 years before then. So we thought what would be an innovative decision for Scotland was actually to have one of the fastest and most constantly renewing national poets. Um, so that was the decision to pull the term down from five years to three years. Young poets who are later career poets who are really busy with life might be intimidated by a 10-year appointment by th but three years I think they could find they could make their mark in it and of course it allows us to react to where Scottish politics is at that point in time and um, just before Kathleen Jamie's appointment or one of the first things that happened after it and um, you generally do a parliamentary reading first was the big um, COP26 the international uh, climate conference was happening in Glasgow so if we were going to appoint a poet at that point in time where Scotland was looking to be a major voice within international climate change solutions, we needed a poet that could speak to that. And Kathleen Jamie was that poet for that point in time. If it was a different time of co type of conference or a different major political occurrence happening in Scotland for that time, who knows, maybe it would have been a different poet. But it allows us to appoint people that are reactive um, that are vital, that are zeitgeisty to the occasion. Um, and I think just reinforces how conscientious Scotland is of being contemporary and progressive in, every, in, in what is considered, I guess, one of the most archaic art forms in the world. Michael, I want to talk about Boyfriends. Uh, it's, it's an astonishing book. Uh, in 2018, 
the world and and Scotland lost the the much missed and much loved Scott Hutchison. Many of us knew him as a singer songwriter and leader of the band Frightened Rabbit. And you too knew Scott this way, but you also knew him and know him as a friend. Uh, as you confronted your grief, you began to write and what began as a, a love letter to Scott soon became a celebration of male friendship and the friendships that have transformed your life. It, it's, it's such a daring and disarming, generous and honest book. And I read it um, in, in the manner of an international book club with, with friends far and wide. And, and the book and you gave us license and, and actually encouragement to be vulnerable with one another. And it occurred to us that you may have actually hit upon a, a powerful antidote to toxic masculinity. And for that, I want to thank you. But I wonder, could you tell us about Boyfriends? Yeah, so it was my first non-fiction book. It was my first book outside of poetry in any way. And it started as a grief memoir, I guess, from that perspective. I found myself in Northern Ireland um, doing another residency um, in a place called the Curfew Tower, which I'll tell you the full story of maybe a bit later or even after this. Um, and I went out there in July. I'd, I'd been booked to go out there in July quite a bit in advance. Um, and I lost Scott, I guess my dearest friend in the world at that point in time in May. And the six weeks uh, from Scott leaving to opening the doors of the Curfew Tower in one sense was an emotional lifetime and the other sense felt like the, a blurring roller coaster click of the fingers. And I was supposed to write a third poetry collection there, um, but didn't find myself really thinking in poetry. There was a, a, a clamp, a numbness, some sort of effect on my mind, on my psychology at that point in time that was almost inhibiting me from writing. Uh, so I took long walks around the coast of Ireland where this curfew tower is and I sat down and I started writing almost like diary style entries um, about some of my favourite moments with Scott when I found myself consumed by the darkness or the grief or the upset of him re leave, uh, leaving. I found that the most useful thing I could do to myself at that point in time was not to wallow in that and not to highlight or embrace the grief, but was in fact remind myself why I missed that person so much. So I sat down and I write, wrote about some of my favourite moments. And that was a recent road trip we'd been on. That was a animal safari around South Africa. And um, that was some of the meals and the feasts we had together. You know, those moments where it's just the two of you around the dinner table, nurturing yourself, time fought away for the crowd that you've battled for. Um, and that was almost an antidote or a, a temporary tonic that allowed me to nurture myself, that allowed me to start writing again at a time when it felt impossible to do so. And in a sense, it was a distraction. It kept me from um, embracing the grief head on at a time that I really wasn't ready to do that because of the emotional turbulence of it all. Uh, I wasn't fortified enough to really understand the, the massiveness of this at that point in time. And I thought there's no shame in hiding from it until you're ready. But to my surprise, it came out in prose. It came out in diary forms. It came out in long sentences. And I thought, well, that's OK. The fact that you're writing is the main thing. And there'll be a opportunity, a later occasion, to turn these diary entries, these musings, um, into poems. You can sculpt them, manipulate them into poetry at a later date. Think of this as an, an archive document that you will turn into poetry. But uh, the book started growing. And to understand my friendship with Scott, which I consider, I guess, the acme, the greatest friendship I'd had in my life, I had to understand all of the friendships that came before it. In particular, I had to understand a lot of the failed friendships. So I analysed the whole notion of making friends from a young age in primary school to high school to university, all the different versions of ourselves we are and these different friendships and what ended up what started off as a grief book ended up as something very different it was a 
love letter to friendship in all its carnations. It was for our friends here, there and elsewhere, for all the friends we love to excess, yet it still didn't feel like enough somehow. It was for the friends that made us who we were today. They were a key ingredients of our personalities. And for me, a lot of those friendships are no longer in my life, but I didn't want them to be seen as failures. They weren't actively renewing themselves, but that made it easier to turn the lens to them because they had a timeline. They had a start, a beginning and an end. And I understood who they were in that journey and who I was in that journey and tried to think about the formulas for friendship that existed within them. Also, all the norms we were running away from, that whole notion of the, the tacit male, the, the male reluctant to expunge his emotions. And, and, and it became such a vital dialogue to be having at a point in time where one in three males in the UK and America were saying that they didn't have a close male friend. They didn't have a friend that they could pick up the phone to and talk about their insecurities or their vulnerabilities or their loneliness um, without the scapegoat of uh, the pub or alcohol or a sport they do together. They just couldn't have a candid conversation with this person that was really close to them, this person that in many ways they they loved, but perhaps weren't even able to tell them that under those circumstances. And one of the beautiful things of the book is the way it ended up and the way I started touring it and reading it. We did a big tour in the UK and then it came out in America as well. And that's that's where we met when I was doing a wee bookshop reading at the Incredible Exile in Bookville along the road mm -hmm. in Chicago. Um, is it became a talking point. You know, I'd said everything I needed to say to a certain extent, was certainly within that period of time within the book, and they'd heard me read from it and answer questions on it. So when it came to the book signing or the meet and greet afterwards, people just wanted to tell me about their friends. And that was brilliant. That was the biggest success that the book could have hoped to achieve, was in fact not offering solely this fly on the wall version of what my friendships were, but for were offering the impetus for people to tell me about a friend that they missed or to tell me about a friend that they'd had all their lives or to tell me about a friend that sadly left this world before their time. Some people even told me about their make-believe friends at different points and all of that was just as valid and it became this big sort of human hard drive of friendship lore, of other people's friendship stories. Um, I guess I was scared writing a book like this that I would end up mainly hearing people's grief stories or suicide stories or lost stories because the way Scott left was very tragic and a lot of people missed him. But it didn't become that at all. It became this opportunity to celebrate the friends around us. And there were so many hot friendship dates happening at the book launches that um, that it just, I guess, filled me full of splendour in a way. Well, there's, there's a person who's watching uh, in John Ballantyne, who is kind of my my best mate in, in Chicago, and I didn't know that we could become closer, but the book certainly helped us become closer. And, and for that, I thank you very much, Michael. Uh, but one, after after the reading you did at Exile in Bookville, we, we went for dinner. And one of the, the folks uh, who was also at Exile in Bookville joined us for dinner, and that was Nathaniel Russell, the, the incredible artist who painted and made the image uh, that, that on the, the cover of the book, Exile in Bookville. And that gives you a, a local Midwestern connection because Nathaniel is from Indiana. So tell yeah. us how, how that connection happened. Well, I can't take much credit for it, really, because it was the book cover designer called John Gray who was enlisted from Faber to design Boyfriends. Um, now, he's a freelance guy, but he did all the Sally Rooney books, all the Zadie Smith books, Sam and Rushdie's books. He's this brilliant book, hub design, book designer. He sometimes works a bit with Penguin. Um, and he'd actually lost his dear friend at the time, a guy called John, Scottish Glaswegian guy who'd been art director at Penguin, his sort of mentor and prodigy. And John was his protege. Um, and a friend gave him an early version of Boyfriends when it was actually out to submission around a few of the publishing houses um, and said, look, one, would you consider doing a cover for this? And two, I think this story will speak to you at this point in time. And John sort of broke protocol and got in contact with me and said, look, 
I've lost a friend. This is consolidating a lot of my feelings for it. It's allowing me to sort of coagulate the wound and, and heal in a way that I didn't expect it to. And I would just really love to, to meet up with you and, and talk to you about the book. And maybe I could do the book cover. Here's some of my work. Um, thankfully, his work was very good and was sort of, you know, internationally known from that perspective. It would have been an awkward conversation otherwise. Um, and we became great friends. And in fact, the two it allowed us the opportunity for me to talk about the friend that I was missing and for him to talk about the friend that he was missing and almost sit at a table together and feel like the other two seats were occupied mm. from that initial conversation. And when Faber asked for a mood board about how I see the cover, I wrote a short essay about how our friendship was a result of a conversation that never happened between the two friends that we were missing. And almost our friendship was a result of a circle that they started drawing for us. His friend as well had went to Glasgow School of Art. There was all sorts of weird coincidences there. And John had seen Nathaniel Russell's artwork. Um, Nathaniel's got a bit of a, a cult following out in the US. I think he's, some of his illustrations end up on like trainers and skateboards. And he does these incredible prints. And John actually initially sent me a picture of two hands clutching each other. There's a big thing about people being scared to hold hands and, you know, in, the, in boyfriends. And it's so common in some cultures in, in India with male friends and, and across a lot of the world that people hold hands in celebration of their friendship. Of course, in the UK and in America, two guys holding hands in representation of their friendship is, is not taken that way at all. Um, so it was sort of embracing why, why our society is unable to appreciate the closeness that that can bring. And John found an image of the hands, which I really liked. And then I had a quick scout around Nathaniel's page and I saw these two embracing friends, which really could have been every single one of the friendships that, that I was writing about, upon about at different periods within their lifelines. Um, and the fact that he was this sort of cool cult American illustrator um, that John had been saving for the right book just had all the special ingredients of something which, you know, felt written in the stars to an extent. So when I saw how close Daniel lived to Chicago, um, we thought it would just be a brilliant opportunity for us to get together and do a sort of artist in conversation, which is exactly what we did in Exile in Bookville. And I felt very lucky to do it. I think it'd been the first time he'd left the state or had traveled anywhere really since uh, COVID restrictions, a long time since then. And Daniel's very rightly quite protective of his work. You know, he wanted to know about the book, to read some of it, to know the stories, to make sure that what I, the narrative that I had to give mixed and cooperated with the narrative of these two lost friends wandering into the night. And I love them. They're all, I love the disproportionate nature of their bodies. Their long looping arms allowed them to hug twice as well. Um, and they could just as easily be philosophically stargazing as they are staggering home from the pub. They could just as easily be lifelong friends as perfect strangers that have just met late earlier that night. I felt that like there was such an openness to them. Um, and the fact that they're not looking at us dead on, we see them from behind, staring off into the distance. So it's almost like we're eavesdropping on their fraternity, on their love. It's, it's a beautiful image. And I thank Nathaniel for, for sending me a copy of it. It's, it's in being framed now and it's going to be on my office wall before we know it. Oh, incredible. From one cult artist to another, uh, Bill Drummond uh, owned a curfew where, where you began to write. Uh, and I'd love to, to know what led you to Bill Drummond and who Bill Drummond is. And in particular, as we're thinking about Nathaniel, you told me about what Bill Drummond is doing by way of a painting for yeah. my friends. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I'll try and give my like two minute TED talk on Bill Drummond. So a lot of people know Bill as the founder orchestrator of a band called the KLF, which at one point in the 90s, I think, uh, became the biggest singles band in the world. What Time Is Love, The Time Lords, uh, 3 AM Eternal. Um, but a lot of that band was based on Bill writing a book called The Manual, where he said, basically, I can write a pop song using a formula and I can use that formula um, to, 
to create number one singles all over all, all over the world. And at that point in time, he had Zoo Records in Liverpool and he'd been managing Echo and the Bunny Men, who were becoming a huge sensation uh, of a band. And I guess people sneered and giggled and thought it's you know, another Bill Drummond Arts project, but he he proved that. He made KLF the biggest band in the world. And actually, after a while of doing the band, they won like best newcomers at the Brit Awards. They had like four number one, three number one singles by that point. Um, they then withdrew all their music mechanically from public availability. And Bill and his KLF co-conspirator Jimmy Cotty took a million pound of that money to the Isle of Jura in Scotland, where George Orwell wrote 1984, and they burned it. They had a bonfire with it. There's footage of it. They made a film of it. Uh, and it was their sort of artistic statement that that money wasn't real from that perspective. And of course, burning money at that level creates so many debates philosophically, economically, aesthetically wise, artistically about what could be done. And they were very cagey about answering why they'd done it. But I do know the bill scraped up the ashes and every ash of that million pounds has been put into a huge arts project at the moment. Um, it was done in the 90s, I guess, at a time where, especially in the music industry, it felt like money was never going to run out. Everything was bold and ambitious. Um, and it's just one of the many, many things Bill's done in his life. You know, he's, Bill seems to have lived the artistic life of 10 people. But he owns the Curfew Tower, this arts residency in Northern Ireland, where I wrote the majority of the first draft of Boyfriends. Um, and he bought it after a failed exposition to the North Pole, where he was actually going to put, as well as an Elvis statue, I believe this book made of reindeer hide and um, invincible paper, I think they called it, which contained a lot of the secrets that Bill um, had never told to the world. And I think other people had contributed their secrets to it. Um, they didn't manage to take the book where it was intended to go. And on the way back from there, he saw this tower for sale in Northern Ireland um, and got the premonition, got the, the feeling, the kismet energy that in fact, no, the mission was supposed to fail. Maybe he was an enduring optimist and he was supposed to get this tower and that's where the book was to go. And of course, the book was put in the, the veritable dungeon. It's an old hundred, couple of hundred year old tower. It had a had a dungeon in it for people that broke church curfew and would be locked away in there. And then um, maybe they'd been in the watering holes too long. Maybe they'd been up to no good. And then their families would have to come and bail them out. And they'd do a veritable walk of shame back to the family home. So the book was in there for a while. But I guess its uh, legacy, its reputation preceded it. And people started trying to investigate whether they could maybe break in or find their way there. So it got rehoused in the special, special um, archive edition of the Belfast Public Library. So you have to go there if you want to, if you want to parse it now. Um, and obviously you can't take it out on your library card. But it left Bill with this big, beautiful tower in Northern Ireland and not entirely sure what to do with it. Um, so he decided to make it an artist residency and he gives the keys to a different organization every year and he pays all the travel and the expenses and that organization get to choose a different person to send there every month of that year and you get the keys for the month you might only go for five days you might stay there for the full months that's up to you january is your month december is your month whichever month you're all allocated the tower is yours for that month um, and Noiriki and me uh, got to curate it for the year of 2018, being the, the tough beta, the philanthropic leader of the organisation that I was. I took the hard month, summer month of July in this <laughs> magical, uh, northern Irish seaside town. Um, and Bill um, obviously features in the book because I'm writing diaries about being in his tower. Um, so there's a bit of a homage to him and everything he's done and our friendship and, you know, all the incredible feats that he's achieved. So he became a quite a key part of launching the book. And in fact, he turned up, he did an in-conversation with me and some live performance stuff. But another thing he did is he took, made this huge canvas um, and he called it the boyfriend's painting. And what he invited people to do um, was under his instruction, 
come up and paint a little part of this painting. Uh, but you were only allowed to do it if you had lost a friend and you wanted to pay tribute to them. And of course, it's very hard to walk into a room and not meet someone that's lost a friend, whether by death, by fallout, by geography, by any of these things. There's all sorts of generosities invested in the definition of loss. And this boyfriend painting was half completed in London for the London launches of boyfriends. And the second half of it is going to be completed in April in Edinburgh in a huge uh, hall called the uh, Queen's Hall, um, where I'm launching the paperback version of the book alongside Holly McNish and Bill will be bringing his painting up and inviting the audience members once more. And by the time that painting's finished, it will be a collectively offered painting by friendship by people who have lost friends. And I think it'd be like, oh, it's almost like a bit of an immaculate conception, I think. Um, but it won't stop there. And Bill will just keep painting over it as he does with a lot of his canvases. These just develop more and more skins. The color schemes will change. The thickness of the paint will change. Um, so it becomes part of the lore, the narrative of the book. Quite a beautiful uh, concept and, and tribute to, to you and the book and friendship. Um, you'd mentioned a kind of companion piece and, and I've just been texted by my uh, my friend Jack Sanders who's who's running tech here and he said we have half an hour left of the, the session so I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then yeah. we're going to open it up to to uh, to questions from from guests and from people who are listening in um, the companion piece that you kind of mentioned to boyfriends was the cat prince and I really really enjoyed the poem the cat prince uh, that you read at Exile in Bookville and I'm going to ask you to read that in a moment but could you tell us about what the cat prince is and what, what it's all about by the way it's coming out in July this year for anybody who has uh, enjoyed today I encourage you to to go and read boyfriends go and read Michael's poetry and to get the cat prince yeah, I guess writing a non-fiction book, there was only so far I could go into my uh, heretical actions towards the trade of poetry. So I had to write a few poems alongside boyfriends to just satisfy uh, that urge in me to scratch that itch. Um, and boyfriends involved a real evaluation or a deep dive into my own memories of childhood, into the emotionalities and the vulnerabilities and the sort of weird um, excited bursts I had as a kid. Um, all those moments where I guess you were trying to make friends too obviously, too hard. You wanted them to be your friends too much and you botched the whole thing. Um, and I guess ended up pushing them away rather than the other way around. And all of a sudden I had this realisation, this memory came upon, upon me at a period of time but I was convinced I was more feline than human child. So I was convinced I was more cat than boy. Um, now, these made for a, a, quite a few awkward play dates, where at that point in the time I would go around, I guess, perfect strangers' houses on the cusp of new friendships. Uh, I would fully de -robe, entirely naked, declare myself the cat prince, and then try and recruit their children into my naked cat gangs. Uh, as you might imagine, that didn't make for very many sequel play dates. <laughs> Uh, those that my mum did beg into existence would often uh, happen out in the, the open air in public environments or they would happen with the caveat, the qualification that I made a promise not to become the cat prince once more. Uh, I guess to everybody's disdain and disappointment that very rarely worked. Uh, I became the cat prince for many, many more years than everyone anticipated me to. In fact, that contains a spoiler, you see, there is a cat prince, and it is I both then and now. Good man. <laughs> I am the cat prince, I declare, already on all fours, already balls naked in the house of Hasty, where there's Adam Hasty, Daniel, and me, the cat prince. We're boyhood budbers, 12 years of silliness, Adam laughs, frantic gasps, guffaws, then pegs it to the bedroom, anticipating the chase. Daniel, wavering between cat and laddie, compañero and fugitive, succumbs to the Gnostic glamour, strips naked for a full feline transformation. 
down to our little furs, little bloods, ready to bringe past the chide of absent classmates who might well hear of this and smite us with shame. For we are cuddle kings, hankering for Adam's adulation, or moggy, moxy, we embrace the cat life, vow inurement to the side effects, carpet burns, wind lash pimpling, the sacrifice of language in each falsetto yowl. As hunters, we're tasked by the creator, our gaze a crosshair, our pounce a ripple of bravura. Who else so guilefully stalks sunbeams? We do well here. It's those damn cats again the neighbours would learn to yop as I race by with a robin red breast between my jaws and Daniel finish shitting in their rhubarb patch. It's convenient not to think of the killer in us, assassin still, holding back our power. As we coil our new cat bodies to a spring, Adam clambers feet atop the bed. And what happens next? is louder than we'd hoped for. Adam's mum, startled by this cacophony, arrives, then screams, curtailing the play date. And later that night, she calls my mum concerned, though my mum never mentions this. I can only assume she was wise to it. The mythos, the hieroglyphs, fathomed we'd soon meet the type of trouble that can really shake boys down. Long days with the teeth tear it out of us and the claws don't stop coming. But not yet, I hear her whisper, not without this moment's orchestra of feeling. As a boy, I was whiskerless, weighed down by the nest of not squat in my belly. As a cat, so much more. Of course, as mother to the cat prince, she knew all this. What a great poem. It, it brings such memory back of, uh, of friendships when I was young. And uh, I, I was not, unfortunately, a cat prince, uh, but um, still there's remember still time, There's okay. still time. <laughs> okay. It's a little too cold in Chicago today, but maybe if you come in the summer. Um, tell, tell us, I've got two more questions, and then we're going to open it up to, to our guest, Gary Gleisner and Ian Houston and, and any other questions that our, our uh, guests might have. But first, I'd like to ask about oysters. What makes them so magic? Uh, and you have tattoos of oysters, I, I know. Yeah. And, and tell us about the book that you wrote with Scott. And then I'm going to ask you for, for a reading from, from Boyfriends to end before questions. So yeah, my poetry collection, the collaboration book I did with Scott Hutchison was called, is called Oyster. And there it is with an oyster on the front of it, which Scott drew. He illustrated the book inside and out. And I have a couple of oyster tattoos, the inside and the out on my arm, which are, I guess, Scott's drawings, which are uh, a language I feel that exists only between me and Scott. It says response to my poems. So it's us almost being in pictorial conversation with each other. Um, but I love oysters. I love the ceremony of them. Um, I love the fact that it used to be the food of the pauper in Scotland. It, surveyed, it saved a lot of um, coastal populations, the mollusks, from uh, communities being plagued by starvation because of the plentiful supply of them. I love the fact that oysters clean the ocean um, the the pool in dirty water, clean it and, and push it back out. Um, I love the ceremony of them. If you eat oysters, I love um, the way that you use them for celebrations. A lot of the time you clink the shell. It's as much of a kiss of the sea and a cheers to life as it is as um, a food source and as nutrition. Um, there's a little bit of double entendre of uh, sexual innuendo going on with the oyster. Um, the oyster is also a name for the, you know, the, the vulva, the, the female anatomy. Um, so it was a little bit of a homage to both fannies, as we call them here in Scotland, and oysters, two of the, my favourite things to put in my mouth. <laughs> um, and 
doing that book together with Scott allowed me the opportunity when we launched the book, when we toured the book, to always find a moment away from the book launch, the hubbub of it, try and find a little seaside cafe or a pub and order a, a plate of oysters together and just have our moment, have our gulp of air together, have something that cements this friendship outside of the um the bravado, the fireworks of the of the performance and the show, which obviously involves everyone in the room before, during and afterwards. It was these sort of secret ceremonies. It now allows me to keep celebrating them. I don't think I'll ever eat an oyster without cheersing to Scott or thinking about a good episode of Cunnilingus. <laughs> well, let's let's start at the beginning then. You you, you said you want, would like to, to read the prologue from Boyfriends, which which I've heard you read a couple of times. I've I've read it a couple of times, and it's it's incredibly touching. Um, yeah, thank you. I guess to finish readings, it always sounds quite exciting or makes sense to me. It's like it, there's all, all, often been so much that's happened in the hour that you're not going to have one poem which consolidates it, which wraps it up, which says goodbye, which has that laconic meaning that you'll take away with it. So I like to go back to the start. Uh, and turn time on its head and often finish readings with the prologue or certainly finish this reading with the prologue. And in that way, it's an invitation to keep talking, to keep going. Um, and the prologue to Boyfriends was almost like my Ars Poetica, my um, ingredients or recipe for friendship. Ever feel like you were fated to be friends with someone, an alchemy in your meeting? instant fondness, part chemical, part kismet. This is how I've felt about every friend I've fallen in love with, none so much as you. Now that you're gone, I want to talk about you more than I care to admit. I find ways to meander and you bend conversations into stories with you at the yoke of them. While the friendships we forge inhabit us, there's no escaping that one day we'll be without them. They may go kindly, with expected effervescence, or, as with you, ungentle and sudden. Either way, grief will come for the heart exposed, like hungry seabirds for a carcass washed ashore. The invisibility in missing you can be savage. Often it feels such extreme emotions should be worn as a sash or garish lanyard, visually obvious in a manner that commands attention, or at the very least avoidance. Think a massive mottled bruise alluding to dramatics or hair going grey from some horrendous fright. Other times this couldn't be further from the truth and the idea that people might bear witness to my grief is humiliating and abhorrent. I started writing this because I needed a way to keep talking to you, to honour then outlive the loss and commemorate the impact you've had on me. It's how we stay together, now we're torn apart. Like Ernest Hemingway said, write hard and clear about what hurts. We often spoke about finding our friends, our friends finding us, what I would chance to call the mathematics of male friendship, yet you were smarter and clearer about, although I can't for the life of me remember how you worded it, because it was more a feeling than a phrase. We mused on being older starters, the joy in having all this catching up to do, about preparing ourselves for loving and losing more friends than any other category of human relation, the metal this takes. There was still so much I needed to share with you, this my method of addressing that, this book, which started as a celebration of you and grew into a celebration of many friendships, perhaps all friendship. What began sweet and meek, yet more lurid than I hoped for, was soon striving to be a testimony for survival. Its list of ingredients including heartwood and hidden lilacs. Could you call it a pean to beauty? More tersely, it is composed from pain, rationalisation, miles and miles of walking and long hours staring down the distance. Funny how missing you has me fishing through my own past, rummaging in the understory of my boyfriends, has me sculpting maxims and conjuring conclusions, 
if there is a day of reckoning ahead. Above all else, I hope to be judged on the friendships I cherished and the love I invested in them. We're not getting you, my clever bastard, back, not as we know it, and I get that. Accepting the finality of this is a Herculean task, best buttressed by any means necessary. How else might we digest its massiveness? A beastly bite of grief where a friend should be is simply unacceptable. I really, really fucking miss you and must be getting on. Um, thank you for that, Michael. It's a, a very, very powerful book. As I mentioned, it made me it made me cry and laugh in uh, equal measure very, very often. And, and I thank you for it. Um, I'd like now to, to bring in two friends of, of the Chicago Scots. Uh, first, let's, let's welcome Ian Houston, who is uh, with the Scottish Business Network, based in Washington, DC, is a poet himself, has written for the Glasgow Herald, and serves on the, the board of Ellisland, uh, Robert Burns, the, the farm Robert Burns uh, tended for a while. And uh, Ian, it's great to see you. You're going to be in Chicago in a few days to deliver the immortal memory at the Burns Supper where we're hosting with the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Historical Society up in Lake Forest. So welcome and uh, meet Michael. Well, thank you, Gus. Thank you so much for Chicago Scots and Michael. I, I can't put into words how beautiful this session has been. Gus, the interview, the uh, the passion of it, and I, I'm sure everyone uh, uh, attendees would agree it's been so uplifting. Uh, it's uh, sometimes we get rigid about what a poet or a poem is actually a, a start and a finish. I think you've written a poem. We're witnessing a poem right before us. Uh, so thank you for that. I, as you're we're reflecting on your friend that did the cover. Um, uh, from Indiana, I was thinking about uh, another Midwestern poet, uh, a songwriter, Michael, that you probably know. I think everyone will know Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan was uh, very influenced by uh, Robert Burns. Uh, he, his poetry is quite extraordinary. He came from Minnesota, um, and uh, he has a, a couple of things I wanted to read to you and then just get your reaction to. He wrote, how many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? And how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? And his answer to that is, the answer is blowing in the wind. A song that probably you're familiar with and, and the audience is familiar with. Michael, I loved your line of the so many lines I like in your work. In the future, we will hear each other better. That's a beautiful line. And I hear Emily Dickinson in that. I hear Walt Whitman in that. And you are in the moment writing and creating and speaking and doing what you're doing so beautifully. As I think of that Bob Dylan line of the answer blowing in the wind like it's difficult to grasp hold of it, it's elusive we don't know for sure what the answers are and I merge that with your line about in the future we will hear each other better as a writer as an artist as a person who is really uplifting people and touching people as you write what do you feel the answers are that you're finding uh, about life uh, and how do you think in the future, you will hear yourself better. Um, and and uh, so just thank you again so much for what you're doing. And, and thank you so much, Gush, for Chicago Scots. Well, I really appreciate that. It's a very tender and trenchant question. And I, and I grew up as a big Bob Dylan fan as well. Of course, he exploded the literary community not long back when he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I got hold of a book that maybe came out 10 years before that um, called Bob Dylan with Poets and Professors. Um, published by a big Bob Dylan aficionado at St Andrews University here in Scotland, where he commissioned some of the biggest poets and academics writing today to 
digest the lyrics of Dylan and decide whether they would categorise it as poetry or music or any of the borders or boundaries before that. Uh, and of course, I guess the overall opinion was um, poetry can be whatever you need it to be at that point in time. There was a brilliant poem that popped up recently saying, I'm paraphrasing, so doing it sort of cumbersomely, saying whatever poem that you choose to write, Somewhere out there in the world, there's a wound shaped exactly like that. Mm. Um, and your poem is going to coagulate that wound. It's going to fill that gap. It's going to scab over it. Or it's going to do the opposite. And it's going to open it back up again and allow it to heal properly. Um, I never really, I think very few people come to poems with answers. I start poems with a question, um, with something that's been bothering me, with something which has provoked me. And hopefully by writing it through, by exploring it in, in the poem, um, I'll find some sort of peace or resolution to that. Um, and I guess the main thing that makes me write poetry as well from that perspective is other people's poetry. I've always been a voracious reader of it. Um, and teaching workshops or running like young spoken word programs, that's always my answer when people say, well, what's your one tip to becoming a better poet? It's reading other people's poetry, surround yourself by it, and um, thrash against it if, if, if it's not your style. Um, um, there's just as much great poetry comes out of contentiousness than out of attunement. If it provokes something in you, then, um, then follow that instinct from that perspective. And I love those lines of, of Bob Dylan's because they're so amorphous. It's searching for the unsearchable, the, un the, the ineffable. Um, and it's the, the notion of ourselves and the future, having a better grasp of ourselves from that perspective is um, that, that desire for continual improvement. I mean, poetry allows you to time travel. You can revisit memories from instances from your past and you can, you can rewrite them. You can reveal the better version of yourself. I made a mess of a lot of romantic friendship life situations and poetry has allowed me to not quite even the score, but at least put the numbers in my favour in terms of here was my good intentions. This is the point that where it went wrong. And this is the happy ending we were denied at that point in time. So it really allows you to tip the world back off its axis and present the version of yourself that you're striving to be. Um, and those sort of confessional poems are, are, I guess, our own anchors for hope. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I want to bring in my, my good pal, our poet in residence at the Chicago Scots and Caledonia Senior Living, Gary Gleisner, who is going to be with his partner, uh, a girlfriend, Carrie Lovestat, giving the lads and lassies a dress tonight at the, the uh, celebration of Burns at Martyrs. Gary's also a great harp player, a uh, harmonica player. Um, but he most importantly comes to the uh, the campus here at Caledonia and works with our residents through his work with the Alzheimer's Poetry Project to write poetry with people living with memory loss. And it's an incredible thing you do, Gary. So on behalf of the, the people who've listened uh, to, to your wonderful creations, I, I thank you. You're on mute. Don't be on mute. Gary. You're on mute. <laughs> no, no better way to start. <laughs> I thank you, Gus. I thank you, Michael, for that orchestra feeling. <laughs> that was so cool. Uh, I'm uh, enchanted by you and your work. And uh, I was especially taken about the concept of... Uh, the ghost of Robert Louis Stevenson as a life coach. And I'm wondering if I can uh, uh, maybe ask for a little bit of information, a little bit of help, because I have uh, a friend I'd like to describe to you. See, I was three years old and my, my best friend was an imaginary friend named Gigo. And uh, one day, and I knew, you know, I knew Gigo was imaginary, but one day I was out playing in the backyard and my father was up in the window above me, and I heard this, Gary, it's Gigo. <laughs> and I looked around, I'm like, 
Gary, it's Gigo. And I went running upstairs. I threw open the door. I ran in. My parents were rolling, laughing, laughing on the ground uh, that they had tricked me into thinking that maybe Gigo was real. Now, flash forward to a little while later when we were both ready to let go. And I was on the Staten Island Ferry, Michael. And I put Gigo into a Coke cup. And he was ready and I was ready. And I, I threw him off into the Hudson and waved goodbye to Gigo. So my question to you, would you answer in the voice of the ghost of Robert Louis Stevenson, life coach, what should I do to, to reunite with Gigo? What can I do to rekindle my imaginary friendship? Well, I think Robert Louis Stevenson would initially say, what a gutter erupt. Um, <laughs> In the way that Gigo was tossed into the wind. <laughs> uh, Robert Louise Stevenson was someone who believed very much in, in traveling, not necessarily for the sake of getting somewhere, but just for the feeling of traveling. And I feel that you've sell, sent Gigo traveling at that point in time. He's becoming a citizen of the world, and I feel like he'll come back to you. You've not, you've had him in a cage too long. Uh, and you've given him the ultimate blessing to free him. And, uh, and I think Stevenson, as the eternal traveller, both um, in life and of the imagination, would, would sanction your actions and the journey that you've sent him, sent him out on him will, would welcome him back. Maybe if you go fishing one day, I feel like you might pop up on the end of the rod, hooked by the gills, but forgiven <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, traveling and I was in uh, a Saranac Lake in, in uh, the Adirondacks. And I was very surprised to find out that there was a Stevenson Cottage. Mm -hmm. And he had lived there in 1887 and 88. He was, the, he was on the men from tuberculosis. He continued to smoke four packs of cigarettes a day during his day. But, uh, but it was remarkable because they, after he lived in the cottage, they made it into a museum uh, almost as soon as he left. And so there's the bed that he slept in, and it's still in the same family. Mm -hmm. And the grandson of the guy who started it is the caretaker. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite remarkable. And again, um, I just want to, you know, just delve into this uh robert lewis stevenson the ghost as a life coach <laughs> i really think this has legs man wow. Gary, <laughs> indeed it does you know there i, I mentioned to michael that there have some favorite musicians um among them is bob dylan uh, little walter who you play and you've written this wonderful poem but steve earl is one of them too and steve earl wrote a book called i'll never get out this place alive one of the main characters is the ghost of Hank Williams, who mm. appears, and and it's a really kind of uh, wonderful uh, and and pretty gritty uh, story. But I, I realise now we're at the one thirty point, and yeah. you've inspired me, Gary and Michael and Ian, and uh, the, the the with the spirit of poetry to go to the other musician who is probably my favourite, and that's Tom Waits, and the the uh, the thought of. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson looking to to be obsessed, not necessarily with the destination, but with the journey. Um, Tom Waits once said, most vagabonds I know don't ever want to find the culprit that re remains the object of their long, relentless quest. The obsessions in the chasing and not the apprehending, the pursuit you see and never the rest. Well, Michael, keep chasing. Thank you very much for all that you've done. And I look forward to welcoming you to Chicago, uh, back to Chicago in sunnier climes so we perhaps can be cat princes together. That sounds great. I'm excited about it. We'll clink oysters once again. And thank you to everyone for joining us today and for the questions and especially to you, Gus, for such a tender, informed and, and personal and illuminating interview. It wasn't an interview, it was a, it was a creative conversation. Do you know, I just realised, Michael, that there was one question that I forgot to ask and uh, perhaps it's a good one to finish on actually. It's great that Scotland supports current writers. Is writing taught and encouraged in schools? And this is from Lisa. Yeah, I think it very much is 
taught and encouraged in schools, especially through Burns, through the oral practice of reciting poems as a good way to memorize language, to understand language. And I think it's really changed and improved with even things like social media and book talk um, and independent bookshops becoming a really cool, nurturing place for people to go, to hang, to discover who they are, to discover what offers they love, to find out identities. My old high school in Edinburgh, for example, which is like an eight story uh, looks like an eight-story Soviet prison uh, with fencing around it, big sort of high-rise of a thing. They unfortunately blew it up. Um, the library was only used to hide away from the bigger kids in if you were being chased during lunch times. They've, they've now built a new school in that area and they have, they've had to open a second lunchtime book group on account of the popularity of the first. And I think that's a lot to do with um, the changing nature of literature on social media, the rise of independent bookshops, the voices they're giving to um, minority figures and groups and representations. Uh, and I think literature is as healthy, as lusty and as randy as it's ever been and in fact has never been before. Beautiful place to finish, being lusty and randy. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Be well, everyone, and happy birthday to Robert Burns. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Thanks, Gus. Thanks, Michael.